So first things first, gentlemen, how are you? Good. Well, yeah, very good. Happy to be in Holland. Well, it's good to have you. And uh, you've been here before because I wrote something down. Um, I have to look, <laughs> look where it's at because I, I, my handwriting is quite terrible. Um, but it was on Instagram. I think you posted it today and uh, you said, well, <laughs> uh, last time I was in Amsterdam, it didn't go yeah. so well. So, so what do you remember of your last trip to Amsterdam? God, that's it. <laughs> uh, Am I comfortable talking about this on camera? Let me, <laughs> let me ask myself just, just this have really a quick quickly. Thing and then... I've got the Dutch courage, literally. Um, well, then just just tell me as much as, uh, as, I, as you can. We'll put it this way. There's certain things in, in Amsterdam which are uh, very accessible and which I hadn't accessed in some time. Mm. And, uh, and, and I essentially underwent a, a process of uh, <laughs> slowly taking apart the edifice that is my ego <laughs> uh, and rebuilding it brick by brick okay. uh, in an entirely different architectural style. Uh, <laughs> that's how I put it. Fair enough. So <laughs> sounds like an inter interesting night. I, I, can, I, I, I understood what, uh, what the Odyssey is about okay. after that. <laughs> last time in Amsterdam I realized that all the monsters all the beasts that Odysseus has to fight and overcome upon his upon his uh, tempestuous return to Ithaca are not in fact real physical things but but the mental demons <laughs> that that are that are accompany psychological struggle <laughs> so you had a nice nice I had a great time, nice time. <laughs> that's, that's very horrible. good to you um, I'll, I'll, I'll move on then um because, uh, well, you have a new album, or your debut album, uh, out now. Yeah. But it, it took a while to get to where we are now. And without kind of delving in too much with what happened with Sony, because I want to talk about the record a little bit more. Um, what did you learn from that experience? Kind of, there, there's, a, there's a line in uh, a loaded, uh, I sold my soul to the devil, kind of. Is that kind of what, what it felt like then? Or yeah. Now? yeah, it felt uh, it felt really cheap. It felt like we were commodifying ourselves. Like mm. uh, almost felt like we'd been used. Uh, how do you how do you put it in terms? I definitely feel like I've learned a lot from well, the process. I, I, I see, I'm trying I, to articulate it. I think I learned. I think two things. Firstly, don't think that other people haven't been where you are mm -hmm. had the same the same kind of um, uh, sense of we can do this differently and that you're the first one because you're not. And the second is don't doubt the um, attractiveness of the temptation mm. of being part of a big ship that moves mm. in big oceans and how nice that feels at the expense of other things. Because right. that's quite attractive actually when you're in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, don't... Uh... Don't underestimate powers. Well, potential to corrupt. <laughs> well, because I, I, I'm sure that for anybody who starts a band or who gets into music, that's that is kind of the dream. Like mm -hmm. you're getting picked up by a major label, and like say the temptation uh -huh. is there. You're like they're throwing money at you. You can do what you want, yeah. and then suddenly things they start to. What I wrote down this uh, story that I read about them bringing in Green Parkers for you. Uh -huh. So so. That must have been kind of like a mindfuck. Like I thought you were allowing us to be who we were, and then yeah. What I'd say is that uh, with things like this, the process, you you like when when you, the way that the say the song loaded, mm. which talks about this experience, describes it as like I sold my soul to the devil tonight, and that makes it seem like an event, like it's something that happens. You sign a piece of paper, mm. and it's this it's this very palpable event that you can put a a star and end on. Whereas in actual reality, the way that these things work is obviously really different. And it's, I think it's really insidious. It's very incremental. Mm. And it happens very slowly and gradually without you realizing it. And bit by bit, you sell off yourself until suddenly there's nothing left. It's not like a, a mass wholesale of property. Right. It's, a, it's a square meter at a time. It's and very before gradual. You know it, the whole field is gone. What, yeah. Was there was there a kind of uh, an end of the line in a, in a way? Was there something that happened where kind of everything came to a head? 
I think it's the third time they told us to go back in the studio and change okay. the album. And do like, there's, there's a, there's a, I didn't remember very explicitly, there was a PDF of changes mm, that you yeah. have to make. So this verse shorter, this song's down there, this lyric should change, no drums there, ta da da make it more pop, ta da da And mm -hmm. we did it twice, and then the third time they were like, you guys, yeah. And at that point we're like, what? There's not, there, there will be nothing left if we do this. We've already compromised 90% of the way, right? I think that was the point for me, I was like, what the fuck, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at that point we realized that we needed to get out, basically. And I think it suddenly dawned on us. We suddenly had this kind of epiphany of realizing just how much of ourselves we'd lost in the process uh, and how overcome we had been by these temptations and, and by this this golden lure of, of success. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thought because at before all of that happened, what was your idea of success? What 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 kind of vision did you have in front of you? I think the success, my idea of success, has always just been to like have a cultural impact, whatever that means. And I think you can have a cultural impact without necessarily selling out stadiums. There's a lot of artists that have had where you can feel their cultural blueprint sure. everywhere, even though they had limited mainstream success. So I think that's always been like my idea um, is is kind of to impact things and to change things and to have an impact on people's lives, to mean something to people. Mm. Um, and again, to kind of change the direction of culture in a particular way, uh, or at least to impact it moving in a particular direction. Um, but I think that when we were with Sony, that vision became distorted. And I think the other ideas of success took hold. Um, because we suddenly felt them within our grasp and there were things that we hadn't imagined before. Mm. Um, levels of wealth and fame, which <laughs> which before we'd never even really entertained, suddenly seemed like very plausible possibilities. Mm. And with that, we became very... Our initial ideas of success, I think, became distorted. Yeah. And so that whole episode ends. And then what were those months afterward? Like was was it very liberating or what was it was it a very anxious time? Oh, it's tough. It was very tough. Really tough. Yeah. Probably well, the day that yeah. that happened it was like essentially the point was oh you guys don't get paid anymore. Okay. Um, and the album's on hold now because we have to pay for mixing and mastering, so we can't do it for a while. So you know you have to probably get a new label. Da, da, da. And you know by the way yeah essentially you're fired, mm. and what you've been working on for a while is now put on on pause. Okay. But but also you're free, right? So it's like this combination of. Oh, oh, you know, like, the, yeah, oscillation, which I'm very prone to, um, personally. Slowly, though, when we things picked up again, we felt like perhaps the struggle was necessary for us to be where we were and kind of glad that it yeah. happened in the first place. Otherwise, we'd be, I don't know where we'd be right now if it didn't happen. So You probably yeah. wouldn't be as happy with the work no. that you did. No, we'd be as happy as people, I think. When, anyway. I look, when I look back at what the album would have been if we'd stayed with Sony and I compare it with the album that we've actually written, Mm. They are worlds apart, right. and this album is just so vastly superior to what we would have done had we stayed with Sony, to what we would have put out. That it kind of, uh, for me, it justifies the whole struggle by which we've reached where we are now, and it has really been a struggle. I don't use that word lightly. I don't think it's it's psychologically. Uh, really really testing spiritually really really testing you know in terms of having to deal with all this, this self-doubt that accompanies mm -hmm. uh this whole process and the kind of you lose your sense of self in it when you become this deeply invested in a project um and so your sense of self-worth is really affected and you have to kind of deal with all these things that people don't really think about um and that certainly i didn't realize were going to become as deeply implicated as they did uh, and it's really hard. It's really hard. Was yeah. there ever a moment for the band then that you thought, well, fuck it, let's let's just <laughs> not be a band anymore. Let's just not. <laughs> it's not worth it. For me, it never felt like an option. It was like yeah. that thing of we. There, it, it reached a point where there was so much pain had gone into it, mm. so much emotion, so much struggle, so much love, so much of ourselves, that it was like not an option to then just have done all that for nothing mm. it kind of it, it demanded the sacrifices we made demanded that we continued I for think. me it was not that it's i felt that but what i felt more strongly was like a duty and responsibility to the al to the album mm. Mm. literally yeah. like there was you know was telling me As an entity. don't leave yeah. me here right? you've been doing this for three years mm. it'd be a shame not to 
you know, like do it justice. Right. So I feel like it had a claim on me almost. Like mm. I've had dreams about the record. I've had dreams about the <laughs> album cover. Okay. Like in a w weird way where it's like almost my enemy or whatever. But That's you weird. know, it's it's had a lot of you know the actual physical object has a lot of grip on me. Right. So I feel like I had to do it justice, and I think I I think we did. So yeah, yeah we so did. We, yeah, it became a mission in a, in a sense. Yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. So so how how much of the did anything did you kind of uh, wipe the slate clean and start from scratch, or were there some uh, remnants of ideas left? There's some remnants, but I think of the initial recording sessions that we did with Sony, which were in this uh, very big, expensive studio in North London, I think that we threw about 80% of it into oh. the trash bin. Okay. Um, and most of it has just been thrown totally to the wayside. Was there a moment uh, after that when, when you started writing again and started developing these songs again that you kind of felt okay now we're we're back on in a groove now we kind of we're yeah. doing what we wanted to do yeah definitely i think it it changed our relationship to each other okay i feel like we really banded together and i think that while we were in the sony process what also started happening is that we'd be, we'd start becoming distant from each other as people right i think that uh, there was a lot of division within the band um which is why zach left um and i think that yeah, we'd, we'd become not a tight knit unit. And this kind of whole episode really forced us to like rally together mm. and be really there for each other and really actually talk to each other and really communicate with each other about everything and to really just be there for each other emotionally and, uh, and also for the project itself. Mm. And I think that the album owes a lot to that. Was this conception of kind of the the decline of the West was was that already there? I think it was it was there from like the very beginning of HMLTD, okay. um, but it's something that it took us a while to figure out how to articulate in a very precise way. So if you look at our very first single, Stained, mm. it's kind of a polemic on the hypocrisies of Western moral dogmas and American foreign policy sure. and. Uh, and so you have that theme of, of the decadent dying West very early on, like from our very first release, which is why in the West is dead in that single, I reference Stained and say three years ago, I said the West is dying underneath my nose. Um, so I think it's, it's something that was always there. And I think that it's very just implicit in the makeup of the band and where we come from ideologically. Mm. Um, but that took us quite a long time to figure out how to actually articulate and present in a coherent manner. Because like you mentioned earlier on, you, you talked about impact and wanting to uh, wanting to impact people with mm. the music. So can I assume then that what you write, that you want people to think and it's not just kind of uh, a quick escape? But you we don't. Well, I think one thing that's important for us is we don't want to tell people mm. what to think. We see our role as artists as being to show and not to tell. Sure. Um, we don't want to be uh, didactic. We don't want to be pedagogical. We want to show the world how we see it uh, and, uh, and not tell people exactly what to think, which is why we don't really engage in talking about specific policies. You'll never hear us singing fuck Brexit, mm -hmm. but we will talk about, say the things that we think might be behind Brexit in a much more broader sense, like the, the collapse of religion, I think is really the underlying reason mm -hmm. for Brexit. Um, you know, when you yeah. when you go to a museum or you read, read a book, political books, books that are like have a substantial like moral, you know, thing to say, a good book will never tell you in the end. Therefore, you should right. go and vote for Bernie. You know, <laughs> it will say something like, "Here's what we are. Here's how it looks to me. Like we could be in one case, in the other case. It's just about like us, us painting a picture of how we look at the world through music, artistically, distortedly, of course. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's like more undertones in political, but they're not they're ambiguous enough. Right. For there to be just like a conversation about it rather than just because it's easy, I think, to be like, you know, go angry on stage and say the world is really badly and we need to do this. And I don't think that's really well, that artful. I, I was going to say yeah. because you don't strike me as as very pessimistic people. Well, I am a pessimist, I would say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, but, uh, fair enough. I'd say I'm, I'm a I'm a short term pessimist, long term <laughs> optimist. <laughs> okay. I I'm a I'm a left accelerationist. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, uh, 
No, I, no but in a I, sense, I like the music is, is, is very, the, the music isn't depressing. It's, there, there's no. a lot of energy and yeah. positive energy. It's, I would it's, say. it's joyful. And like, I think that, you know, what is music if not a celebration of joy? I think mm. music should, should be joyful. Uh, I think the album, in spite of itself, in spite of all the uh, doom and gloom that is present on a lot of the tracks, I do think it's a joyful album, ultimately. Uh, and it's about, you know, how, how even in the midst of crisis and chaos and turmoil, we still have to find joy and meaning. And it's about that search. And one of the ways uh, I suppose that musicians do this quite effectively is through playing live. And that I've mm. seen some clips on YouTube of the live shows and they're, they're very well, uh, energetic uh, once more. So, yeah. so what, what goes into those live shows and how do you experience, it's probably difficult to describe, but how do you experience those, those live shows in terms yeah. of making that connection that, that we talked about? Uh, I think that, uh, again, we see it as like, an, as a, as something that should be celebrated. I think like, you know, we, we want to celebrate life. We want to be, we want to create occasions for joy and we want to create reasons for joy. And I think we see the live shows as, as being these joyous celebrations of life. And I think that is what great art often is. Mm. Uh, not that I'm saying we're great <laughs> art, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think with, with the live shows, one thing that's really important for us is that we want it to be as immersive and as theatrical and as preposterous mm. as possible. We want to really challenge the audience. I think when we started going to shows, when we all moved to London a few years ago, uh, we'd quite often go to a show and it would be people staring down at their shoes and not really engaging with the audience. And again, that makes it feel very one way. And it also creates, I think, a, a weird power dynamic where it's like, okay, yeah, you're paying to see us, we're just doing this. Whereas I think we try and see our live shows as like a collaborative mm. thing where us as the performers and the audience as the audience are both engaged in this collaborative uh, positive feedback loop process whereby we create something which is the event which is the the overall show and that's not that doesn't just come from us that really does come from the audience right. and the difference between a great show and a bad show is the audience when the audience engages when they come to us when we meet eye to eye and there's a connection and we build something out of it. That's what makes our, a great show. Yeah. And when that doesn't happen, that's when we come off stage angry, frustrated, no matter how well we've played yeah. technically, no matter mm. how well we've performed technically. If there hasn't been that, that collect, the connection, that collaborative formation of, of this thing, of this event, that's when, that's when it's a bad show. I mean, for, for me, it's, um, if you want to listen to the album, you know, it's easier just to stay home. Sure. And Put the record on that's probably going to have the better takes on right mm. the drum is going to be tighter <laughs> if you want to well, the reason why you leave your house and you pay money to go into a sweaty room is because you want something different i think what that is personally at least is you use the songs as a means to get something else out of it right it's like they're, they're, they're the vehicle and what something else is, is like this, this feeling of being like everyone's in the same like almost like dancing together in a way mm. that's the, what think, we try to focus more on i think on. community is a big part of it yeah um i think that it's about like we live in a really individualist age right. where genuine connections with other people are, are few and far between uh, and feel harder and harder to come by. And so I think that with our shows, we really want to foster a sense of shared experience and of community. And that's mm. what collaboration really means for us is shared experience, shared building of something, shared creation. Right. You mentioned something um, about challenging the audience. And now in, in one of my favorites on the album, Satan, Luella and I, there's, there's a line that every filth is art. Not yeah. So w how do you kind of uh, balance those two things where y you don't go over, to, over the top, but you still challenge your audience, as you say? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think that Obviously, I mean, you don't want to go over people's heads, but I think that the worst thing that you can do is patronize your audience. Right. And I think that way too many people patronize their audiences. And I also don't really think that that's what we would ultimately be satisfied doing. It would be quite easy for us to write uh, an indie album or like a rock album that appealed to what we thought were very dominant tastes. Uh, and I don't think that it would satisfy us at all. I think that we really get a thrill out of challenging people and out of kind of forcing people to reconsider things and 
trying to change minds. And I think that I think that's what good art does is it does challenge people. And I think that, you know, the opposite of that is this is this accusation that you get of pretentiousness where mm. anything challenging is often labeled as pretentious. And I find that such a such a dumb kind of critique. Um, yeah, I think I just think it's I think it's really important to challenge people. I think that's what that's what all good art does is challenge. And if it just if it just reaffirms what you already believe, if it just reaffirms the worldview that you already subscribe to, if it just panders to that, then what's the fucking point? Mm. Then you're st stuck in that bubble. Yeah, you're just you're just stuck in that. You know, it's like on it's like the thing on Facebook about how your algorithms right, just right, right. feed you back the same thing that <laughs> feeds you back the opinions that you already support. It's just this kind of self-aggrandizing, so well, self-whatever, self, -whatever, self mm. uh, perpetuating, self-fuckery. <laughs> in terms of the music, then, because well, one thing I. Uh, enjoyed by the record and and kind of the music that you make in general is is that it's in a way unpredictable if you compare it to to kind of kind of what's in the charts mm. so what what is your approach musically i mean the, i wrote certain words like carnivalesque where uh kind of uh, with joanna and, and those type of songs i wrote down uh, war is come uh looming kind of the, the start reminded me of a saloon for some reason mm. and yeah yeah so so what, what is your approach in those is, is it a visual thing for you as well uh, in, in terms of what? In terms of the surprise element? Or? Well, in kind of uh, what you write about, but also in terms of where it can go. And then... I think that the important thing for us is to conjure up worlds. Mm. Um, I think that, and again, this links into the idea of challenging people. Right. I think that part of why we challenge people is because what we do is we imagine. We try and imagine worlds that the audience can step into. And we really try and create them in the fullest sense possible. Uh, and the worlds that you experience on the album are deeply imagined ones. And I think that the whole point of imagining is that it draws attention to the contingency of the actual present situation, of the actual reality. Uh, and in drawing attention to that contingency, it reminds you that it can be changed. And that's why I think that imagination is a really uh, radical political act. It's because again, it, it draws attention to the fact that, you know, things can be changed, that things don't have to be how they are. And I think there's a real lack of tendency to imagine in contemporary culture. Um, increasingly, I think artists are more and more and more afraid to imagine different worlds. Uh, and all that does is feed into this, uh, this psychology of being unable to imagine anything other than the world that we do actually exist in. And I don't think that that world is the best one. I think mm. that it's important to dream and it's important to imagine and it's important to posit utopias. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, from a more like musical point, um, you know, it used to be that people had just like not many technically available options to them to do things, right? Like so. When you're in the 1800s or 1700s, you, <laughs> that's that point, yeah. <laughs> you have, you know, yeah. but it's true, right? Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. You have, yeah. you know, you have access to like <laughs> violins and cellos and violas. Go, go yeah, yeah, and then you have like guitars, and you have, now you have all of them together at the same time. So I think it's so you can go one of two ways. Either you go, okay, it's there's so many colors here, let me just pick one and go for it, or you do the thing where you mash everything together and it becomes like really, really brown and ugly. Mm. We try to do the in-between point, right? So it's like use as many different colors as possible, have a wide palette of sonics and worlds, and but at the same time, not like make it really dissonant and ugly. Mm. I think that's it's a risky thing, which is why it took us so long as well. I think we pull it off, but that's up for others to decide as well. But that's that was the intention at least, I think. Mm. Yeah, go along with that. Finally, then, because, well, like you say, it has been a struggle to get to where you are now. Um, it wasn't an easy album to make. So how do mm. you have you given what, what you're going to do next? Any thought already? Or is that something you don't want to worry yet? It's funny. We, we spent three and a half years making this album. <laughs> and uh, it's been, <laughs> it'd been out for two weeks before people on Twitter started saying, hey, when's the second album coming out? <laughs> I'm like, fuck you, man. We gave three and a half years of our lives this shit. The hardest three and a half years of our life. <laughs> the best. And, uh, and all you care about is when the next one's coming. Fuck you. So they listen for, for, for one weekend and then... Yeah, yeah. but I mean, that 
that may that that probably uh shows i guess again the 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 dwindling attention spans which mm-hmm. defines uh the contempt the contemporary consciousness um and so i guess just like how in our songs we skip between genre and genre to cater to those ever decreasing attention spans so we will make hasty work of getting to the creation of a second album uh pandering to the, yeah. the, the, the reason why i ask because i, I can imagine <laughs> that when it has been such a struggle as it has been that you're perhaps a little bit more hesitant to to in a way jump into something there's, like there's that there's again. definitely an element of fear I mean, Duke, yeah. Duke, the day after the album was released, Duke was like, okay, guys, so we have to like, da, 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 da. <laughs> and I was like, no, man, just give me a fucking second, please. <laughs> please. I can't right now go back into that space. So I think within us as well, but in between I us, think, yeah, still a difference. There's, there's, yeah, there's still some difference. But I know, I think, I think it's important to have like that period of re- reflection. Right. Uh, but having said that, we already have like so much material saved up that we wanted to put on West of Eden, but that we couldn't fit on it. I've like tried to make the con- the most concise debut album possible, and it still ends up being 50 minutes long, which for a debut is is pretty big. Uh, and you know the songs that we discarded, a lot of it wasn't because they were bad songs; it was because they didn't fit into this this strict narrative that we'd come up with for the album, the concept of the album, the concept of West of Eden, and and all its themes. Um, but there's a lot of songs which which uh, which we have in the in the back room that we we really believe in and that we kind of want to show the world. So I think we already have quite a strong skeleton. Um, I certainly think that the second album is going to be a lot easier than the first, <laughs> contrary to to most bands where, well, they, you know, they always say that the second album is the right. hard one, right? But we kind of had already made a first one because we put out like 12 singles and, and it took us three years to make this actual debut, the real the real debut. So I feel like the, this experience that we've had with the first album is the experience that most artists have with their tricky second album mm. and it certainly has been tricky so uh so i think that the third or the second however you want to put it i think it should be a breeze sounds good yeah gentlemen thank you very much for thank your time. you very much thank you